Rachel, thank you very much indeed for reading. Good morning, everybody. Please do keep that passage of the Bible open in front of you. Let me wish you a happy Mother's Day. And uh, let me welcome you really warmly, particularly if you're with us for the first time or one of a number of old friends back with us visiting today. We're delighted to have you back. Uh, There's also an outline on the back of the notice sheet that you may want to follow along with as we go, as we come towards the end. This is our penultimate week, I think, in the book of James. We said when we began the series that it might... um, Studying James together might be a bit like boot camp for us as a congregation. We pointed out that uh, there's just 108 verses in James, but there are 54 imperatives or commands just in those few verses. And so reading and studying James together has been a a bit of a working over for us, I think, as a congregation. It's been exposing, it's been challenging, but many have said that it's also been deeply encouraging to be studying this part of God's word together. And that was James's purpose as he wrote the letter. Uh, His first readers were Christians from a Jewish background, just to give you a bit of a recap if you've not been with us. And they'd been scattered all over the ancient world by some persecution that had broken out against the Jerusalem church that we can read about in Acts chapter 8. So they'd been forced to leave behind not just lots of friends and family, but livelihoods, careers, and friends as well. So the result was that as, as well as having to deal with all of the, the normal struggles that anybody has to, to deal with when you live in a fallen world like ours, the things like loneliness and sickness and frustration when things don't go according to plan and bereavement and family troubles, as well as all of that stuff, Lots of James's readers were now having to live with a, a troubled life of poverty and oppression. And perhaps worst of all, we've discovered in these last couple of Sundays that at least some of that grief was coming to them from people within their own church congregations. It might be that they'd infiltrated the church from the outside and were trying to rot things up, or just as likely, actually, it could be that they were people who'd said that they were Christians, but have now drifted so far away from anything like Christian living that you begin to wonder whether they're Christians at all. And we got a a flavor of some of their behavior with those, um, if you're here, you'll remember them, the, the three portraits, pen portraits, they were called, of hellish wisdom that we looked at in last week's passage, self-promoting gossip that, that puts others in the congregation down to make me look good, self-sufficient pride that throws its weight around, even in church, to try and further my own purposes and agenda, and self-indulgent wealth that hoards its cash and lives a life of luxury while workers are exploited and other believers even are are trodden underfoot. And James's readers were, some of them at least, were on the receiving end of all of that. So life was not easy for them, far from it. And James was worried that in the midst of those trials and struggles, many of which we'll be able to relate to, they might begin to take their eyes off the prize, the heavenly prize that awaits God's people, when Jesus returns. So chapter 1, verse 12, if you just flick back to it, has given us, um, it's been an important verse, uh, increasingly so as we've gone on in our studies, I think, where James says, blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life which God has promised to those who love him. There's the the prize that's meant to be in view. The the crown is like a a gold medal or a, a laurel wreath that would be given to a victor. And the faithful God has promised to give to all those who love him the crown that consists of life. But James's fear that is that under the weight of their trials, his readers might, and you can see how it would happen, might lose sight of the the glories of heavenly life and slip instead into what he's called double-mindedness. Literally, the word is two-souledness. Being as much a friend of the world as they are 
of God. And so he writes this letter with the intention of of warning or pulling back to the truth those who'd already stumbled into a a life of settled double-mindedness and of safeguarding the rest of us lest we join them. I was trying to think of an illustration for it. I couldn't come up with one. And then one of you gave me one. I I ran with some friends uh, for dinner this week. And uh, the the man of the house was telling me that when he was a child, it was some years ago and before the Children's Act, I think, and laws safeguarding against this sort of thing. When his parents wanted to restrain him but give him a certain amount of freedom, they used to tether him to the ground with a sort of a long chain or a rope. And uh, so there was the tether in the middle of the garden and he had a certain amount of freedom. But if ever he ran too far, there was a jolt on the neck or the throat. I don't know quite where it was tied. That reminded him that he needed to come a little bit closer uh, back in. So lots of freedom, but just a, a boundary at the edge to stop someone from straying too far. I'm not going to tell you who it is, and I'm going to try not to catch his eye. You can work it out afterwards. But don't spend the rest of the sermon thinking about who it might be. That would not be a good use of your time. And James's letter is designed to do something similar. To, to keep people safe, lest they wander too far away from the truth. That under the pressure of, of, double, of this, the trials that they're facing, they might run so far away that they get into danger. And so like a, a loving brother, like a pastor, he wants to write a letter that will, will hold them in, keep them safe in single-minded devotion to the Lord, waiting, remaining steadfast under trial until they receive the crown of life, being the the first fruits of God's new creation that God wants his people to be. Well, our passages this week and next are the conclusion to James's letter as he crystallizes much of what he said into two very simple commands. How do we live in the midst of the trials of life? How do we persevere in single-minded devotion to the Lord, even if we're on the receiving end of this mess? Well, the answer is by being patient and by praying. Patience and prayer. And we'll look at prayer next week. I hope you'll be able to join us. But you'll see today's answer of patience there in verse 7, very clearly. Be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord, like the farmer who is patient You'll see it in verse 8. You also be patient. And you'll see it in verse 10 as an example of suffering and patience. Take the prophets. So that's our, our first point this morning. Endure patiently because Christ the King is coming again. And uh, straight away you'll see from verse 7 that we've got the old James back. I think we can put it that way. We've pointed out um, lots of times in this series that The tone of this letter is one of warmth and affection. Uh, He's called them repeatedly brothers, my brothers, my beloved brothers. But then William pointed out to us that in the the third major section of the letter that runs from chapter 3 verse 13 to chapter 5 verse 6, that language of brothers disappears almost completely as James addresses the the double-minded in his congregation head on. But now here in the conclusion, the tone reverts as James once again addresses the genuine Christians in his congregation and so in the congregations and says, be patient, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. I don't know how patient you are as a person in general. I'm hopeless at this. I was brought up to believe that patience is a virtue but I'm not altogether sure that we believe that much in our culture anymore. Uh, Certainly as consumers, we seem to want things that work quicker and quicker, especially technology, dial-up internet, do you remember that? Then it was broadband, and now if it's not super fast fiber optic, it's not worth having. We want computers that turn on instantly, that's the craze. One-click ordering on websites. Uh, We don't like being put on hold on the phone or when the Traffic lights turn to red just in front of us because we know what we want and we want it now. In fact, I was wondering, tell me what you think of this, if the the combination of technological advance and materialism has left us less patient as a society than at any other moment in our history. I don't know if that's true. Someone can tell me later. 
But I dread to think what we'd be like if we were in the same situation as James's readers. How would you cope, do you think, if your boss was defrauding you out of your wages week after week? And yet you had to sit there going through the motions of work, hungry and exploited, while he sat in his office gorging himself on a life of luxury. And can you imagine how much worse you would feel if then when you came to church on a Sunday, you saw him there in the front row? I'm not in the front row. That's a, yeah, no, good. Not, not this front row in particular, but there in the front row looking pious and, and preening himself. I feel sure that I would want to take matters into my own hands, stand up for my rights, to take what was owing to me, what was rightfully mine. And James says, it's not our business to do God's business. That's the essence of it. Be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. The phrase um, coming of the Lord translates a Greek word, parousia. Parousia was a, a technical word that referred to the arrival of a king or an emperor on an official visit. So just in a very subtle way, when he says the coming of the Lord, James is reminding his readers that the, the true emperor in our world is no Caesar or president, no prime minister, but the Lord Jesus Christ. So be patient, he says, because Christ, the one who is king, is coming again. And we can see that the the Lord's return is the controlling motivation of this whole little section, just by the way that James repeats it. It's there in verse 8, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Verse 9, don't grumble, because the judge is standing at the door. Now, some have misunderstood the New Testament writers at this point. They've taken that phrase, that the coming of the Lord is at hand, and said that the apostles mistakenly believed that the Lord Jesus was going to return within their own lifetime. And, of course, the logic goes, if they're wrong about that, it stands to reason they're probably wrong about a whole bunch of other stuff as well. But when James says the coming of the Lord is at hand, he doesn't mean that He's expecting him any time this week or this millennium necessarily. He's just saying that when you, when you stand back and look at history, the history of God's dealings with the world as a whole, that the, the next thing on God's task list, if you like, is the return of his son. So creation of the world, tick, yep, done that. Rescuing his people and giving them the promised land, tick. Sending Jesus into the world to die and rise again, tick. Growing and building his church all over the world, yep, that's well underway as well. So the only thing left to do is for Jesus to return as the Lord of all, to judge his enemies, to deliver his people and to hand to them the crown of life. And James says, brothers and sisters, that day is coming. The Lord Jesus will return to judge the world with equity. It's not our business to do his business. So you leave it to him to right the wrongs and be the judge of the world and be patient. Now, obviously, that's easier said than done. That's why James has to say in verse 8 to establish or strengthen your hearts. And it's interesting, because elsewhere in the New Testament, to strengthen the hearts of his people is something that God does. But here James is saying, no, you've got to do something to that end as well. We're so to, as we've been doing all morning really, to, to dwell upon, to think about the, the justice and the blessings that will flow when the Lord Jesus returns, that we are strengthened to remain steadfast for him today. And the chances are, if I'm being impatient, it's because I've taken my eyes off the return of Christ. I want things now that God only promises then. And if I'm growing, it with, if I'm growing in my perspective of the last day, well, you'll see a growing patience in my life. The applications are as many as the trials that we, we face in life, I guess. 
um, colleagues giving you a hard time for your faith. You're tempted to, to put him down behind his back or to try and engage him in public debate so that you can make him look silly. But vengeance is mine, says the Lord. I will repay. So be patient and leave it to the Lord. You, you discover that someone at church is gossiping about you. And you really want to give them a piece of your mind. Maybe your reputation has taken a knock unfairly. There's a particular trial you'd like to see the back of. You're not sure what God is doing through it. Well, God's timing is not always our timing. He is God and we are not. So be patient because the coming of the Lord is at hand. You could apply it more broadly, couldn't you? You're frustrated at how slow God is to change you or to change your spouse or your children aren't learning godliness as quickly as you'd like them to. Well, what makes you think that shouting at them will help? You can add your own examples later. Be patient, says James. And to underline his point, he gives us three examples of patience. The first is the farmer there in verse 7. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it until it receives the early and the late rains. You also be patient. The early rains come in autumn, just after the crop is planted, and the late rains arrive in spring, I'm told, just as the crop is ripening for harvest. And even today, the farmers we know know that there is nothing whatsoever that they can do to manipulate the rainfall, how much is going to come or when it's going to come. And so actually, they're pretty good. They don't get worked up about it. They just wait patiently. And James says, well, learn from their example. But there's a, a little bit more to it than that, as the references on the sheets hint. These, um, every time these early and late rains are mentioned in the Old Testament, it's either in the context of the faithfulness of God in general, like in the Deuteronomy passage, or his faithfulness in salvation in particular, like in the Joel passage. So James has picked his example here very carefully. He's saying to his Jewish readers, remember what you all know already about the faithfulness of God in his providential ordering of the world, in his goodness in saving his people. Well, that God, the faithful God, has promised that Christ will come again. And if he's promised it, and if he's promised that he will right every wrong, then you can be sure that he will do it. So leave him to do it and be patient. Example number two is the prophets. Um, verse 10, as an example of suffering and patience, brothers, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. He doesn't tell us which prophets he means, but presumably he has in mind a, a man like Isaiah. Um, Isaiah spent almost his entire ministry preaching to deaf ears. And then tradition has it that for his trouble he was sawn in two to end his life. Jeremiah was cast into the pit and endured untold troubles from his own people as well as from God's enemies. Uh, just before he's martyred in Acts chapter 7, Stephen asks the Jews, which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? But in all of that, says James, those prophets remained true to God. They persevered in speaking in the name of the Lord. They endured patiently, so now you be like them. Speak up for God. Uh, that The hope of the first coming of the Lord sustained them. And so now the hope of the second coming of the Lord can sustain you. Learn from their example. Speak up for Christ. God will act when the time is right. So be patient. Final example is my favorite. Verse 11. Behold... We consider those blessed who remained steadfast. You've heard of the steadfastness of Job, and you've seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. Many will know something of Job's biography. He was living a life of happiness and luxury and true faith when his whole world began to fall apart. Uh, he lost all of his wealth. All ten of his children were killed. 
His wife turned against him, tried to turn his heart from the Lord. He lost his health. His friends arrived on the scene, and we think, finally, someone's here to help. But all they do is make matters worse by accusing him for crimes of crimes he hadn't committed. And yet, through all of that physical and emotional torment, Job remained steadfast and patient. Do you remember his defiant statement of faith? Even though God slay me, yet will I hope in him. So again, Job's a brilliant example because the thing that sustained him through all of those trials was his hope of what God would do in the future. You may remember the words from Handel's Messiah, if not from Job. I know that my Redeemer liveth and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. Though worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God. So Job had nothing left to cling to in this life, but he had hope. And so he remained steadfast and patient. And James says, brothers and sisters, whatever your trial, whatever your pain, be like Job. And of course, as the end of verse 11 reminds us, you only have to to read on in the book of Job to see how through all of that, the compassionate and merciful hand of God was to be at work. Because God first used the trials to refine Job, and then actually he restored to Job far more than he'd ever lost in the first place. That was God's purpose. That was his goal. And so says James, that will be for you Christians as well. The compassionate and merciful God promises both to use your trials to refine you in the present and to deliver you from your trial in the future, uh, if not before then, on the day when he hands to you the crown of life. So be patient. Establish your heart. Strengthen your hope. Uh, I made the mistake a couple of months back of letting Emily, I probably shouldn't tell this on Mothering Sunday, but um, letting Emily pick the DVD for our film night. It was not a wise decision. We ended up watching The Best Exotic Marigold Hotel. Have you seen that? I, Maybe it's good. Um, As far as I was concerned, its main redeeming feature was that it provided me with an illustration, and that's worth any any price of a DVD. There's a character in it called Sonny, and uh, he keeps on saying famously, everything will be all right in the end. And if it's not all right, then it's not yet the end. Everything will be all right in the end, and if it's not all right, it's not yet the end. It's the message of the film, really. We all long to hope for something, and the world can offer you blind hope like that. Oh, it'll be all right in the night. It'll all come good in the end. We know that within this life, it it doesn't always. But the world cannot offer you the crown of life. In fact, no one can, apart from the Lord Jesus Christ. And he will come again soon, if we trust in him, to hand it to us personally. So let God be God and strengthen your heart because Christ the King is coming again. In the context of James, to be patient is to do what we've been talking about for weeks, to to ask God for his heavenly wisdom, to listen to him and do what what he says, to submit ourselves to God, to resist the devil, to draw near to God, to purify our heart, to weep for our sin, to humble ourselves before him to endure our trials patiently until he comes again. Well, this is one of those talks where I feel as though we've had enough in point one to keep us going for a whole week, but we need to move on because um, after this general appeal for patience, James draws out a very specific, if slightly surprising application, and I just want us to, um, to touch on it for a few moments before we close. I've Summarized it on the sheet with a line from Psalm 141 there where David prays, Set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth. Keep watch over the door of my lips. Um, We've noticed in James that there's a a big emphasis on the the power of the tongue. Do you remember James saying it's only small but 
like the, the bit in a horse's mouth or a ship's rudder, the tongue determines the whole direction of life. Or like a, a little spark in a forest, it can set ablaze, a whole life ablaze with unrighteousness. And again, twice in this first half of his conclusion, James pauses to remind his readers in the midst of this patient endurance of trial of the importance of their speech. First in verse 9, no grumbling. Uh, Let's read it. Do not grumble against one another, brothers, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. And again, if we think ourselves back into the situation of James's first readers, it's easy to see why they'd be tempted to grumble. Uh, Your boss defrauds you of a week's wages and then turns up to church with his new Rolex. Someone tramples on you in a discussion about church policy and then turns up on Sunday all happiness and smiles. It'd be easy to spend your Sunday lunch, wouldn't it? Complaining about other people in church. But James says, godly patience does not grumble. Uh, You may have been wronged by someone. They may be guilty of sin. You can leave it to the Lord to judge them, but guard your tongue. Now, there there will be times when we've got to challenge one another on a matter of godliness, uh, and that's not ruled out by this verse. But there is no place for this sort of grumbling. You leave it to God to sort them out, and guard your tongue, because we'll, we'll all be judged one day too. And all of our... I'm better than him, I'm better than her, self-righteous grumbling, will not look good on the day that he judges. I was thinking about this. I think often we're too polite in our particular culture to grumble about people to their face. But I was, um, I was challenged when I heard one preacher ask his congregation to, to keep a note of their, the kind of conversation that they have with their their closest Christian friends, you know, the people that you feel most at home with, most relaxed with, and to see how much of that time was spent grumbling about other Christians. And I think um, the irony is that I suspect that the more involved you are in a church, and therefore the more closely we have to work with one another, and the longer we know each other, and the better we know one another's faults, therefore, well, the more tempted we will be in this area. So David's prayer is a good one. O Lord, set a guard over my lips. Even when the pressure's on, help me to watch my tongue so that I say only what is helpful for building others up. Finally, briefly, verse 12, truth-telling. James says, above all, my brothers, uh, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or by any other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no be no, so that you may not fall under condemnation. We all know it doesn't need to be said, really, the terrible cost of lies. Uh, We've seen it in the public sphere as we've watched reputation after reputation explode. Chris Hume, just the latest. But many have seen it closer to home as well. Families destroyed by lies. But God has always wanted his people to be different. Very simply, to mean what we say and say what we mean. In the old city saying, he wants our word to be our bond. But weirdly, by the time of the Gospels, the Pharisees had departed from God's good intentions and had developed an elaborate system of oaths, which meant that only some of them were binding while others weren't. Jesus gives some examples in Matthew 23. If you swore by the temple, you were not bound. But if you swore by the altar in the, by the gold of the temple, you were bound. If you swore by the altar, you weren't bound. But if you swore by the gift on the altar, you were bound. So the whole thing had been flipped on its head. Instead of being a, a solemn guarantee of truthfulness, the giving of an oath, had, uh, the taking of an oath, had become an elaborate way of concealing a lie. And so Jesus in the Gospels, and then James here, drawing on the teaching of Jesus, says, just leave it behind. Uh, Lies are the devil's game and not ours. We were born by the word of truth. It's planted within us. So let's be people of truth. Let your yes be yes. Let your no be no. 
no ifs or buts or maybes, no spinning the facts to make yourself look good. Just tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Um, I've no idea how they do the studies. There's a professor from the University of Virginia who says that uh, 20% of all 10-minute conversations, social conversations, include a lie. I don't know if that's true. Here's a few examples. Tell him I'm not here. Uh, I'm on my way. I'll be home in half an hour. Um, I'll get back to you before the end of the day. We've had problems with our servers. I'm not sure if your email ever got through. Uh, We'd have loved to come. Uh, How about this one? I'll be praying for you. God would say, lies are of the devil. Just tell the truth. But the question that's puzzled commentators for years is, why does James say this here? And some have assumed that verse 12 is totally disconnected from its context, just a random reminder about telling the truth. But we've seen as we've gone through James that he's a much more careful writer than that. And so our default assumption always in the Bible is to think that the verse must have something to do with what's on either side of it. So again, you'll have to tell me what you think about this. But it, if you think back into the situation of James's readers, you can begin to see why he would need to underline the importance of truth-telling just at this moment. Self-promoting gossip. So if you're on the... You've discovered that people are are gossiping about you behind your back and lying even. Wouldn't you want to get your own back? Even if you have to, to gloss over one or two facts to bring them down a peg or two? Self-sufficient pride. You go to a committee meeting. People are pushing themselves forward like they seem to be in chapter 3, verse 1. They're throwing their weight around or, in our culture, throwing their emotional emotions around in an effort to, to get their own way. Wouldn't you be tempted to play them at their own game? Even if you have to exaggerate a little bit to shore up your position. Self-indulgent wealth. You might be tempted to think you see the Hear the rich gloating about their holidays. I would love what they've got. It's only a short step from that sort of coveting to wheeling and dealing and insider trading and shady deals in an effort to accumulate your own wealth. And James says the temptation may well come, but do not yield. You have a good father in heaven and you are in the exact situation in life in which he has placed you for your good and for his glory. He will work through your trials to make you more like Christ. And he will give you a crown of life at the end. So be patient. Allow him to work in you, to grow you. Don't go pushing yourself forward. Don't go lying. Don't go grumbling. But be patient and ask God for the heavenly wisdom you need to see life his way. Weep and mourn for your sin. Trust him to execute justice when his son returns. And look forward to the day when he hands to you the crown of life. Be patient, therefore, until the coming of the Lord. Let's pray. Our Father, we want to thank you for this clear reminder of the coming of the Lord. We praise you for the hope of perfect justice and also for the hope of perfect deliverance from any trial we might face in church, in the world, or in life in general. We ask that we would believe enough in the return of the Lord Jesus and trust enough in your goodness to us that we would be patient in the present, not giving in to grumbling and lying, but trusting you. Give us, please, the wisdom we need to be patient in this life until your Son returns. For his name's sake we pray. Amen.